didn't realize I was on already. Okay. <sighs> Y'all know the drill. I get up here and I, I, I touch Mike's stuff. <laughs> Dial it in. Fix my mirrors. <clears throat> well, I would like to um, point out a very odd thing for me to do, and that is to prepare in detail the ins and outs of a sermon about the mystery of God. I felt like every time I was getting some good ground and gaining some good ground, then I would basically be like, all right, God, I've got this nailed down. You know, I know what I'm doing. I know exactly what's going to happen. I, I know exactly what I'm going to say. And then he would say, mystery of God. You know, how do you plan completely for a mystery? And, and I don't think you can. And that's where we live. That's where we live. Last Sunday, we talked about readiness, the pep talk of last Sunday. And if you remember, or if you were able to watch online, or, or just hear it for the first time, um, we must always be ready to pray, evangelize, or perish. Pray, evangelize, or perish. We must always be ready to do that. But that does not mean that we have to have all the details figured out in order to be ready. We get, we get ready for trips, and we get ready for vacations, and, and we may plan a vacation, for example, down to the very time we get there and, and all that we're going to do, and it rarely goes that way. I mean, my, my nanny and pa just got back from the beach, so they smell like the beach. If you want to smell someone who smells like the beach, they're right there. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, they planned it when they would get there, what they would do, and then they had a flat tire on the, way, on the day when they were coming back. You know, you just don't know. You can't plan it. But you can be ready. You can be ready. So last Sunday's message, be ready to pray, evangelize, or perish. Um, but in that is an understanding that though God is known, we do not have all of God figured out. Though God has revealed Himself, we're still being brought into focus ourselves. He may be perfectly expressed, but He is not perfectly perceived by us. When we feel that tension, uh, which is really the fullness of life, living out of faith, uh, our faith in Jesus Christ, when we feel that tension and when we're afraid of that tension, we can start to do things. Some things we can do that are pretty cute. I think sometimes God looks at his children and he goes, oh, how cute. And I think of this, actually, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is from one of my favorite theologians, my daughter Catherine, and I believe this is in the second grade. I have kept this on various phones and on the Facebooks. Uh, which one doesn't belong? You ask on the tests. Nike, House, or Jordan? And she circled House, and I would agree with that. And then she goes, Why? Because I figured it out. <laughs> Can I get an amen for my daughter, Catherine? <laughs> she has that don't ask me dumb questions kind of way about her sometimes. Why, why do you think? You know, we don't have any Nike Jordans in our house for one thing. But, uh, because I figured it out. Sometimes I think God looks at us when we think we've got God figured out. And he goes, oh, how cute. I do. I, I think he does. I think he genuinely, what a good, good father. What kind of good, good father wouldn't appreciate this kind of response? Um, but it, and it can start cute, but then it, then it can get, it, it can go downhill from there. And this is what I mean. If you are not comfortable, if you cannot exercise your faith, understanding that though God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, that though he has done this, there is still mystery there. If you, if you have trouble with that, and we all have trouble with it, but if you compensate for it, what you start doing is you start making boxes. And you start basically telling God to get in the boxes of your understanding. I have been guilty of this. If, nod your head if you've been guilty of this. I have been guilty of creating boxes of my understanding and, and asking God to please get in. You know what I'm saying. 
We do this with regards to awesome things in life. What if we have gotten our house in order? What if we are living out the faith and we're just going right along and then maybe perhaps things start going right at work? Uh. You know, maybe I got that bonus. Uh. Maybe someone at the Chick-fil-A paid for my meal before I got up to the window. Uh. And then I offered to do the same for the car behind me, but I asked, but what, what all did they order? That's a passenger van. I'm in a Civic, you know. So, but you know, what's dangerous there? If things start going your way, ah, if things start going your way and you, you fall into the box thing, then you start to conclude, okay, well then if I live right with Jesus, then financially things get better for me. <gasps> you, see, you hear how dangerous it can get? See, that's that prosperity gospel business. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. The last time I recall, Jesus did not have a place to lay his head, and no one lived more faithfully to God Almighty than God revealed in the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? So we got, mm-mm, we got to be careful with that. Now, so that's if things are going right. What if things are going bad? What if you go through a tragedy? You know what, I'm, you know what I mean? What if you have had basically believed that things go right if God is with you? They go right according to your desires if God is with you. And then all of a sudden things start going really, really hard. Maybe someone that is just a, a very part of your, your heart, you know, a very part of your life. What if someone passes away? What if they go through something awful? How about I mean, parents out there? What if your children are going through something that's just like, oh, I never wanted them to have to experience that. Then the danger becomes, okay, well then I guess God isn't with me. Then I guess I did not perform my faith properly and now he's mad at me and he doesn't love me anymore. Do you hear how dangerous it can get when we, when we start to compensate for the discomfort of living between God revealed and God the mystery. So today is going to speak to that a little bit. It's, today we're going to sort of be encouraged by this, by the Word of God. And, and it's my privilege to do this together with you. God as mystery, revealed in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I mean, God admits, look, I'm a mystery. I'm a mystery. I'm with you. I'm engaged with you. I'm protecting you. And, and he's speaking to a people have, who have been in exile. You have known exile. But don't put me in your box. Why? Because my thoughts are not your thoughts. You build your boxes according to your thoughts. That's irrelevant to me. I can speak into your thoughts and I can redeem them and I can inform them, but be ready to be molded as clay is molded by a potter. As the heavens are higher than the earth, which we cannot even conceive. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I sense, I, I, I experience a freedom in that statement and I hope that you do as well. What if God is only as good as your imagination? Do you hear it? What if God were only as good as my imagination? I've got to, I've got to be honest with you. I've gone through times where my, my highest thought of goodness wasn't very good at all. And I am so grateful that God is so far above that, that it was not within my capacity to bring God down to my level, but instead, He would kneel to my level and lift me and lift you up. Thank you, God. That your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. He is a mystery. God is a mystery, but God is a mystery who is with us. God is a mystery who is near. This has been my favorite psalm ever since I dedicated myself to reading through the book of Psalms while my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, then girlfriend was away on a trip and I said, I'm going to read the Psalms. And I put that off until right before she got back and I was like, well, how long is the book of Psalms anyway? I don't think I had ever looked at the book of Psalms. 
there's only... So that just flew through there, and I came across this, ver- this, this chapter, and, and there was a particular verse in it, and I loved it, and, I, and then I forgot which one it was. Well, that's okay. I'll just start over. Here's Psalm 139. <laughs> you have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. Now, you know me. We talked about this a little bit last Sunday. Isn't there a wonderful difference between knowing about someone and knowing them? Does God just know about us? Does He just pull the manila folder out of His filing cabinet and go through the, the bio and go through our professional history? No. He knows us. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, whether it's 3 a.m. Or, f- or 4 in the morning. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. In other words, you know my life. You know the big things, the little things, the mundane, the fantastic. You know all of it. You know the pretty flowers of my life and you know the dirt. Before even a word is on my tongue. Lord, you know it completely. Have you ever known someone or been in relationship with someone so long that you just... You knew what they were about to say. You just knew. Or you knew that when y'all walk into a certain, posi- a certain situation, you just knew how they would behave. I knew you would do that because I know you. It's amazing. Even before words on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You, you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too lofty for me to attain. How wonderful is that? Too wonderful. God is with us. He knows us. He knows our life. But He's not us. God is with us. He knows us and He loves us. But He is not us. Last Sunday I mentioned the name Yahweh. Yahweh means I am that I am. I am because I am, and for no other reason than you can imagine, I am. That's God, the name Yahweh. And then I sort of jokingly, but also theologically seriously, give him a last name. I am, and you are not. It doesn't it fit. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? I mean, it's just, I think it's just the most awesome thing that the greatest human being there is, the greatest human being I know, is still not matched with God in terms of goodness, love, wisdom. He's too lofty, too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee From your presence. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea. In fact, can I can I take sort of like a pen and just kind of write in a little bit here? I have your permission to do that. This this is a prayer I like to do with friends who are in the hospital, and if I have the great privilege of being with them, then this is what we do. We say, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, if I am on the fourth floor of this hospital at the end of the hall, if I am being woken up through the night by beeps and buzzes and lights coming on and and people are supposedly taking care of me, but waking me up through the night... If, if I'm eating food that just kind of barely passes the test of what food is, if, if I'm wearing a gown that doesn't go all the way around, but I really wish it would, if I'm connected to this thing with fluid on it and I'm dragging it down the hallway and I'm trying to keep my gown shut, even there, your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. You see why this psalm is my favorite? If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. We've said that. We have said that. Surely this is it. Surely this is as good as it gets. Surely when it comes to life, I've lost. 
and even the light will become night around me. If I say that, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You see, there we see that though God is mystery, God does make an impact. God does reveal Himself in the same way that light impacts the darkness, and thank God it does. In the same way that light impacts the darkness, redefines the darkness, chases the darkness away, God reveals Himself. A mystery, but a mystery being revealed. And a mystery revealed to us perfectly. The Son. The Son is the image, the expression. If we were to go literary with it, the word of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In Him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things, what things, people, have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in all things, in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. God has perfectly revealed Himself. And we keep trying to take it all in as we should, but can we be fine with try- admitting we're trying to take it all in? Let's put it in perspective. Have you ever been, for example, uh, to the Grand Canyon? Or have you been to, just to look out over the ocean? About two years ago, I was in Colorado, mountain biking, and then made my way over to Utah, mountain biking. I can honestly say I'm faster than at least three Mormons that I have met. (laughs) Challenge. Um, And do you know what so many of us, myself included, were trying to do as we're looking out over this vast expanse. I mean, it's just, it, to me, I thought I was in a movie because I'd only seen this kind of imagery in a movie. Never been out west before, but I'm trying to take it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Oh, I know what I need to do. I need to what? Take a picture. So this is what everybody looks like. We all look like, um, what are those? Sprinklers. We all look like this weird human sprinkler system. We've got our phone. Okay. And we try to take it in. I'm, t- I'm taking a what? A panorama? Panorama? So I'm doing it. And then my, my leg twitched. Ah, dang. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's this, there's this absolutely gorgeous expanse of God's creation just sort of revealed for us, torn open for us, laid out for us. And what are we doing? We're looking at a screen this big. And we expect it to what? Fit. Another box. Does it fit? We send it. Oh, look at this. It's so beautiful. And someone opens the picture and they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, swipe. You know, no, it doesn't fit. We want it to fit. It doesn't fit. We want to keep it. Peter wanted to build three tents. If you remember the time that Peter, James, and John were taken up the mountainside during the transfiguration and, and the true glory of who Jesus is and the great history and future of salvation is laid out and he's just shining like a light chasing out the darkness. And then Peter says, oh, I should build three tents and we should just kind of stay here and keep this going. 
And that was considered foolish. You can't fit it into your phone. You can't fit it into a tent. We can't fit the greatness and the goodness and the awesomeness and the mystery of who God is into boxes. We will try. And because he loves us, he'll remember it as because I figured it out. I think it's awesome. You know, this same language comes to us in John. And I just... I really wanted to just read this from John. I just want you to hear the words because it speaks to the great expanse that is Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. You see, God has expressed Himself. God has revealed Himself. It's the perception, our activity, that's not perfect. And that's okay. He was in the world. And though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, the word, the expression, the image became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So... We get to, we get to live into a growing perception of the revelation of who God is. We get to do this. We get to do it together as a church. We get to do it guided by the truth that is in Scripture. Not guided by our boxes and therefore from the box going to Scripture trying to change it. Can I say that again? We get to grow in our perception of the perfect self-revelation of who God is. We get to do that with Holy Scripture and live from that, not live in boxes. I have moved a lot in my life. You would think I would stop trying to live in boxes. You know that feeling, don't you? Can't find what you need. So you just go buy another one. The day you buy another one, right? The order of life is out of whack when you try to go from the box to the truth. Go from the truth and live from the truth and forget the boxes. That's the challenge. And I think it can be done. And God gives us a way. This awesome, awesome privilege of worship that we get to do. The word mystery. We get it more directly from the Greek. The Greek word for mystery is musterion. Can you say that? Musterion. Depending on your Greek teacher, it might be pronounced different. But I'm your Greek teacher today, so ha ha. Musterion. That which was hidden being revealed. I mean, what makes a good mystery? What makes a good mystery, if you read a good mystery, if you're into reading mysteries, is that there's something hidden and through the course of it, it's revealed. The musterion, that which was hidden being revealed. If you go the Latin route with this, you get sacramentum. And you know what word we get from sacramentum. The sacrament. Yeah, very close. This holy mystery, the sacrament of holy communion. For I received, says Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, ah, let's go back. I'm reading. I could probably, let's not assume that I remember it. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim how it is you have life at all until he comes. So 
with regard to this business of the mystery of God, of living between God's revealed in Christ and the mystery of God. You know, this, this seemingly insignificant act that we get to do and that you get to do at home, this seemingly insignificant act is so mighty, it reminds us that God has revealed Himself perfectly throughout the history of salvation. Ultimately, in this full expression, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is also, in the very act of doing this, this is also a refocusing. This can help us see maybe what we've never seen before. Did you know that? I understand that there are traditions where you have to already be a confirmed believer, but we come from a tradition that says, you know what, this can actually open your eyes. We come by it fairly honest, honestly. Luke 24. Jesus was walking along on His way to Emmaus. There were these two others who were walking along on their way to Emmaus. You know what they believed? They believed in the teachings of Christ. They had heard about the teachings of Christ. They knew Him to be great. They believed in the death of Christ. They knew that Christ had died. They, they believed Him to be selfless in His death. That's awesome. They did not yet have faith in the resurrection of Jesus. He was right there with them, but still veiled by their unbelief. Veiled by their lack of faith in His resurrection. He walked right there with them. He even explained the Scriptures to them. And they still weren't getting it. I mean, Jesus, talk about the best Sunday school teacher ever. Was teaching the Bible to them. The author was teaching the Bible to them. And they still weren't getting it. But when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. You do not have to be a member of this church. You do not have to be a member of any church. You do not have to be able to confidently say, I have full assurance of salvation And I have a full and saving faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't have to say that even. But look, if you have heard an invitation to the the possibility of living with gratitude between God revealed and God the mystery, from here on out, if if you just believe God wants to do something with you today, and that God is good and able to do it, then I encourage you to receive this and to participate in this blessed act of worship. I heard the, you know, used to that sound meant some sweet old lady had a peppermint. (laughs) And then all the little kids looking at her going, wish I had a peppermint. (laughs) This is weird, but don't get too confused by the form of it. Because you know what? It's not the packaging that makes this what it is. It's not the packaging that makes this what it is, is it? This is something God is doing. A sacrament is a sacred moment created for you and I by God personally. So why don't we invite His activity upon this? Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank You so much. I pray, Lord, that You can increase in all of us here today an understanding that You have revealed Yourself. You're not withholding Yourself. Move in our hearts and give us an increasing sight away from the sin that blinds and to a faith that sees. Work in us. Bless us. Send your Holy Spirit in this great meeting with you today. Send your Holy Spirit upon this very simple mm, bread. And have this bread become for us the body of Christ. I pray that we are blessed anew by the body of Christ that took our sin away. Dear Lord, please send your Holy Spirit upon this juice. And have this juice become for us the blood of Christ. May we experience the grace of the blood of Christ. That blesses us with a lifelong and eternal relationship with Christ as our Savior and Lord. Forgiven, given life by you personally. And Lord, I pray that you will move in our hearts 
help us flatten those boxes. We're not even going to bother recycling them. We'll just flatten them and send them away. Help us flatten the boxes and embrace your word. Embrace your truth. Embrace your son, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we receive this special gift from you to us. Amen. You may receive.